These dishes were so revolting, they had Ramsay questioning if the chefs even belonged in the kitchen. Some of its worst contestants and their most disastrous performances. But Jonathan really takes the cake when it comes to pushing Chef Ramsay's buttons. Just check out the dish he served Chef Ramsay in the very first episode of the season. Is this guy for real? Seeing Chef Ramsay shocked and swearing isn't uncommon, but this dish and its name left Chef Ramsay questioning what on earth he was doing on this show. Jonathan clearly has next level confidence in his cooking. Otherwise, he wouldn't be so certain that Chef Ramsay, one of the most respected Respected chefs in the world would appreciate his dish. But then, Chef Ramsay takes a closer look and picks out the oddest element. Can? Yes. You open a can of pineapple. And now, for the most entertaining part, when Chef Ramsay picks up a piece of pineapple, he's absolutely stunned. Adding pineapple to a savory dish isn't unheard of in American cuisine, but Jonathan has taken it to another level with this twist. You open a can of pineapple and you stick it on top of a chicken. That's right, Jonathan didn't even bother to cut his own pineapple. He just plucked it straight out of a can. When Chef Ramsay tries to address this major issue, Jonathan, surprisingly, responds with confidence. Big mistake. Chef Ramsay is definitely going to give him a piece of his mind. How could a contestant even look Chef Ramsay in the eye and say that, especially in the high pressure environment of Hell's Kitchen? 45 minutes, limited time. You can literally see Chef Ramsay slowly losing his cool with Jonathan, which isn't surprising given that Chef Ramsay is a professional chef trying to get the best out of these amateurs. Jonathan is about to receive some of the harshest criticism of his life. Up to this point, Jonathan was brimming with confidence, but as Chef Ramsay starts in on him, reality sets in and all that pride is stripped away in seconds. What Chef Ramsay says next marks the end of Jonathan's journey on the show and the end of his dreams of becoming a top chef. You're so full of shit, even your eyes are brown. Come in here and serve me a canned fucking pineapple. You can fuck off now. Finally, Jonathan faces reality and realizes that none of his antics are going to fly with the notorious Chef Ramsay. The harsh truth hit him like a ton of bricks. Luckily for Jonathan, he managed to stick around on the show despite getting on Chef Ramsay's bad side. This was a close call, and Jonathan will likely never make such a mistake again in his career. Chef Ramsay made one thing crystal clear to Jonathan. It's an absolute freaking mess. Can. That's what pissed me off more than anything. But you know what? What happened with this next contestant was even worse. In season 13 of Hell's Kitchen, Jennifer served up one of the strangest dishes ever seen on the show. You won't believe your eyes or Jennifer's unshakable confidence in her creation. This dish is easily one of the worst ever served in Hell's Kitchen. I visualize my dish and I'm usually spot on, so. Jennifer is known for her over-the-top enthusiasm when it comes to cooking, and her pride clearly got the best of her this time. Listening to her, you'd think she had everything under control, but this time, she was way off the mark. I'm the complete opposite of Roe. I'm just using the heads. Jennifer had a major rivalry with another contestant, Roe, and their tension started early in the season. I'm gonna go with the spot from the heads off because my favorite part is sucking the head out. The two were constantly at each other's throats and couldn't work together at all. In this episode, things were especially tense because Roe had narrowly avoided elimination in the previous round, and Jennifer was itching to find a reason to throw more shade her way. Throughout the episode, Jennifer kept insisting on using the head of a prawn, convinced that it was the best part because, in her opinion, the highlight of eating prawns was sucking the head. Her sense of what people enjoy was definitely unusual. We find an elegant. This is what I'm thinking, just using the, the heads of the spot prongs. Ro, knowing her time on the show might be coming to an end soon, tried to ease the tension and even suggested that using the prawn head was a bad idea, but Jennifer refused to back down. It looked like her stubbornness was about to backfire. Player Ro would have been like, absolutely not, don't put that head on a plate. In the end, Ro decided not to interfere. After all, what good would it do her? Jennifer continued to create her sophisticated dish and actually served the prawn head in the Amuse Bouche challenge. Things got interesting when the team had to drop one of their four dishes because the other team only had three members. Everyone's attention turned to Jennifer's dish and they almost voted to cut it. Sterling wasn't feeling confident in this round and made it clear that he didn't want his dish up for judging, which meant Jennifer's dish had to go forward much to the team's dismay. How does it taste? It tastes 100. I mean, it tastes good. Chef Ramsay was puzzled by Sterling's lack of confidence and asked why he thought his dish wasn't worthy of being judged. Chef Ramsay was stunned by Sterling's answer. Finally, it was Jennifer's turn to present her dish, and the special guest judge was shocked by the awful creation placed in front of her. Oh my gosh. <gasps> The other contestants couldn't resist making jokes, and Jennifer was definitely humbled by the experience. Jennifer, who the hell are you hanging out with? All that overconfidence had certainly backfired, but wow, that dish was truly disgusting. This might be off-putting to some people. Sucking on a head. Next up on the list is a tortellini dish, and just hearing the name, you'd think, how could anyone mess this up? But believe it or not, one chef managed to botch it in the worst way imaginable, turning what should have been a simple and elegant dish into a culinary disaster. Tortellini, what's inside the filling? 
It's just a cheese. It's a packaged tortellini. The chef in question, Mike, made a critical mistake that left everyone, including Chef Ramsay, utterly speechless. Chef Ramsay has always been clear about his disdain for packaged food, especially in a competition where fresh ingredients and culinary skill are supposed to shine. But Mike, either out of sheer ignorance or arrogance, presented Chef Ramsay with a dish he claimed was made with fresh packaged tortellini. The phrase itself was enough to confuse and frustrate Chef Ramsay. What did Mike even mean by fresh packaged? The whole concept was contradictory and made no sense in a kitchen where freshness is paramount. Packaged fresh tortellini. That's how it's sold, Chef. But it didn't stop there. Mike then had the audacity to explain to Chef Ramsay that this is exactly how the tortellini was sold. Fresh tortellini. That's how it's sold, Chef. We use fresh tomatoes. Uh, they were canned tomatoes. Was this guy serious? Did he not realize that he was serving this dish in front of a live audience? And that his every move was being scrutinized by one of the world's most demanding chefs? The audacity was staggering. And just when you thought it couldn't get worse, Mike followed up with an even more outrageous statement that left everyone in shock. The reaction from the crowd said it all. Mike had made a colossal mistake. It's hard to imagine anyone in their right mind walking into Hell's Kitchen and thinking it would be okay to serve Chef Ramsay pre-made food, let alone something as basic as tortellini. Come on, that was a joke. The expectation in Hell's Kitchen is that contestants will prepare everything from scratch, showcasing their culinary expertise and creativity. But here was Mike, essentially reheating prepackaged food and presenting it as if it were a genuine culinary creation. It was a move that could only be described as foolish and lazy. Even the other contestants were taken aback by Mike's actions. They were in disbelief that someone would be so brazen as to take pre-made food, heat it up, and serve it as if it were a dish worthy of Chef Ramsay's approval. And to top it all off, Mike openly admitted that the tortellini was packaged, as if that somehow justified his lack of effort. It was a moment of utter disbelief for everyone involved. When it came time for Chef Ramsay to judge, it was no surprise that he awarded the point to the female contestant, giving the women's team the victory in that round. But what happened next was the real twist. Mike was not happy at all with Chef Ramsay's decision and decided to retaliate with a comment that showed just how out of touch he was with the situation. It's not like it's packaged dog food. Fuck, that's bullshit, bro. Mike's decision to lash out at Chef Ramsay was a clear sign that he was looking for trouble. But in Hell's Kitchen, challenging Chef Ramsay after making such a great mistake is a surefire way to seal your fate. Come here. Chef Ramsay is known for his high standards, especially when it comes to subpar foo. Mike's disrespectful comment only fueled Chef Ramsay's anger, and what followed was a verbal lashing that Mike undoubtedly had coming. Yeah, okay. You got anything to say to me? Say it to my face. Chef Ramsay, who had been having a bit of fun just moments before, quickly shifted into serious mode, and Mike knew that he was in deep trouble. The look on Chef Ramsay's face made it clear that there was no room for excuses or backtalk in his kitchen. Mike, who had been so confident just minutes earlier, now found himself on the receiving end of Chef Ramsay's wrath. Say it to my face, not my back. You got it. Fuck off. Without hesitation, Chef Ramsay gave Mike a taste of his own medicine, making it abundantly clear that in Hell's Kitchen, there is only one boss, and that's Chef Ramsay. Mike's actions and attitude had earned him a place among the worst contestants in the show's history. Serving prepackaged food and then trying to justify it was a move that was not only foolish, but also deeply disrespectful to the integrity of the competition. In the end, Mike's experience serves as a cautionary tale for anyone who thinks they can take shortcuts in Hell's Kitchen. Chef Ramsay's standards are high, and for a good reason, this is a competition where the best of the best are supposed to shine. Mike's blunder is a reminder that in Hell's Kitchen, there's no room for anything less than excellence, and anyone who thinks otherwise will quickly find themselves in hot water. And this brings us to the next example on the list. We often see some of the worst dishes on Hell's Kitchen as the season progresses, but in Antonia's case, she managed to get herself eliminated in the very first episode with her disastrous dish. What is it? It's a uh, Mardi Gras gumbo. Oh, Jaws. Just one look at her creation and hearing Chef Ramsay's reaction was enough to make it clear this dish was utterly revolting. What on earth was Antonia thinking, kicking off the competition with something so unappealing? Despite Chef Ramsay's immediate disgust, Antonia remained unfazed. She was confident that once Chef Ramsay tasted her dish, it would blow him away. But we all know what's coming next. Every time I make my gumbo, it always gets eaten, and everybody loves it. In a first for the entire Hell's Kitchen series, Chef Ramsay's reaction to Antonia's Mardi Gras gumbo was unprecedented. And never before had Chef Ramsay reacted so violently to a dish, actually spitting it out in sheer disgust. The dish must have been truly awful for Chef Ramsay to be so physically repulsed, left wondering how anyone could cook something so terrible. Oh, excuse me. Antonia was left speechless by Chef Ramsay's reaction, but it was Chef Ramsay who was genuinely shocked this time. He couldn't even comprehend what had been served to him, as Antonia managed to offend even his refined palate to its core. Have you tasted that? No, I didn't get a chance to taste it, Chef. Uh, oh. 
When Chef Ramsay questioned why she hadn't tasted the dish herself, Antonia complained about the limited time she had to prepare it. She apologized, but Chef Ramsay was so taken aback that an apology simply wasn't enough. I'm sorry it wasn't up to par. Up to par? It's unedible! Antonia, clearly stung by Chef Ramsay's harsh critique, started to change her attitude, still holding on to the belief that her gumbo was a top-class dish that could impress anyone brave enough to try it. What Chef Ramsay did next was something he had never done before, and it was perhaps the most humiliating moment of all. He passed Antonia's dish around to the other contestants, asking them to taste it, a move that was nothing short of insulting in the world of Hell's Kitchen. Having your dish judged by your peers in such a manner is the ultimate embarrassment. The other contestants were stunned by how awful the dish was, was, and they didn't hold back in their comments. The brutal honesty from her fellow competitors was a clear sign that Antonia's dish was a complete failure. But the situation got even worse when Chef Ramsay asked another contestant to voice their opinion on the dish, and following their harsh criticism, Chef Ramsay took things even further, solidifying Antonia's place in Hell's Kitchen history for all the wrong reasons. Chef Ramsay had never criticized the dish so harshly on any other platform. That tasting of the big bowl of mud. Antonia clearly had a misguided notion of what Hell's Kitchen was all about, and after receiving such a scathing critique in the very first round, it seemed unlikely that she would be cooking for anyone in public anytime soon. Without a doubt, this was one of the worst dishes ever to be served on Hell's Kitchen. Oh my god almighty. Oh boy, she was a disaster. Put one table in there. Any more than that, you'd be fucked. In the signature dish challenge, Maribel stepped up as the fifth contestant to have her dish evaluated by Chef Ramsay. She offered up her Argentine plantain soup, which Chef Ramsay didn't take kindly to. In fact, he spat it out. I'm so sorry. But, well, that wasn't the end of her torment. Maribel felt embarrassed but brushed it off by thinking Chef Ramsay couldn't handle the spices. During the perfect steak cut challenge, Maribel was the last one from the red team to have her cuts judged. Holy fuck. Only two of Maribel's. But guess what? She managed to get only two approved. And then, in the relay challenge, she was the third member of her team to take a turn. When her first 15 second relay started, Rachel forgot to mention the third dish was tortellini. With no option left, Maribel only worked on the chicken and salmon. Although she tried to figure out the third dish on her own, she couldn't. Oh my god. Sometime later during the final relay, she also forgot to tell Sarah that the third entree was tortellini. After seeing the blue team present three dishes compared to their two, it wasn't hard to see that she felt terrible for missing the third item. That's the only thing that was running through my head, how badly I screwed up the third item was, and I was like, during the third dinner service, Maribel was assigned to the meat station. Two hours in, the red team had sent out a good number of entrees, with Lamb Wellingtons being the crowd favorite. This put her under extra pressure. When she announced having only six Wellingtons ready while eight were needed, Heather wasn't pleased. She had to explain the situation to Chef Ramsay, who suggested making more from scratch. Fucking useless. I love you too. John Philippe then informed Chef Ramsay that one of the red tables was on the verge of leaving. Chef Ramsay conveyed this to the women, and she said she needed seven minutes, to which the table hesitantly agreed. She then sent up Wellingtons that were undercooked when they were supposed to be rare, prompting Chef Ramsay to send them back to the oven. After enduring several rounds of yelling, she began to tune Chef Ramsay out while the table grew increasingly impatient. Eventually, a lady from the nearly walking out table came to the kitchen, but she wasn't about to let her get upset. She assured them her Wellington would be ready in 45 seconds, starting a countdown. Unfortunately, the Wellingtons she brought out were still undercooked. And what do you think the customers did? Well, of course they left. Oh, come on! It's the only time we've been doing, Maribel! Christ! Sadly, Chef Ramsay was quick to notice this. And nope, he wasn't about to let it slide. In his very next breath, he accused her of giving up. But he wasn't done yet. The next thing you know, he decided to shut down both kitchens. Six. During the next dinner service, Maribel was manning the garnish station. Just as the red team was about to finish their first round of entrees, her mashed potatoes ended up overcooked, and it was a sticky mess. Last thing in this country to eat. But her performance continued to hit a new low with every service. In the fifth service, her plate of foie gras came back for having hair on it, which reflected badly on her quality control. Dude, my hair's tied up. That's straight. I have curly hair. Oh, Thank you very much. Philippe, why not ask him? Make him put a hair in it. During the sixth dinner service, Maribel was handling the garnish station. A lukewarm salmon dish was sent back because of Maribel, prompting Chef Ramsay to express disbelief that the first thing she had a hand in turned out poorly. I can't believe the first thing you touched 
this evening in service. And well, that was the last straw for him. Maribel was eliminated that episode, and well, I'm sure none of us are surprised. Clearly can't lead a section, let alone a kitchen. But here comes the juicy part. In her exit interview, Maribel admitted that her struggle to fit in with Sarah and Virginia was her downfall. She expressed that her husband and daughter would be proud of her for staying true to herself throughout the competition. Themselves. I'm here trying to work as a team. I think that was my weakness. My husband will see that and he'll be proud of me and my daughter will. Well, what can I say but good for you. But you know what? In the high stakes world of culinary competitions, few moments are as defining as the presentation of a contestant's signature dish. It's a pivotal occasion where chefs strive to showcase their skills, creativity, and culinary philosophy. Yet, not every dish is destined for glory, as evidenced by one particularly disastrous presentation that has become infamous in the annals of cooking shows. Kareem. Colleen. Kareem. Colleen. The contestant, brimming with confidence, approached the judges with a dish she believed was a masterpiece. A combination of chicken fat, Yukon gold mashed potatoes, and white truffle cream gravy. It? it is a chicken fried ribeye with Yukon gold mash and white truffle cream gravy. On paper, it may have sounded like a luxurious creation, but the reality was far from it. The dish's visual presentation alone was enough to raise eyebrows, greasy chicken fat pooled around the mashed potatoes, and the truffle cream gravy appeared heavy and unrefined. What was meant to be an indulgent, sophisticated dish looked more like a culinary catastrophe. Undeterred by the visual shortcomings of her dish, the contestant beamed with pride, seemingly unaware of the horror she had set before the judges. Her unwavering confidence bordered on delusion as she insisted that the recipe was a special one handed down from her mother. Chef Ramsay is gonna love it because it's freaking delicious. It's like an orgasm in your mouth. Come on. This claim was met with puzzled stares, particularly when it was revealed that she had inexplicably added sugar to the mashed potatoes, a move that only deepened the judges' confusion and concern. As Gordon Chef Ramsay, the culinary expert and arbiter of taste, prepared to to sample the dish, the tension in the room was palpable. Everyone hoped, perhaps against reason, that the taste would redeem the dish's appearance. But the reality was harsh. Chef Ramsay's reaction was immediate and unforgiving. He grimaced as he tasted the dish, and without hesitation, he spat out the offending morsel. His disgust was evident, leaving no doubt about his assessment. Chef Ramsay's refusal to eat more than a single bite was a powerful statement about the importance of culinary integrity. For him, and for any serious chef, excellence is non-negotiable. Oh. <laughs> I don't need to laugh. In the aftermath, the contestant was left to confront the stark reality of her failure. It was a humbling moment, a reminder that in the pursuit of culinary excellence, there is no substitute for skill, judgment, and attention to detail. The episode served as a cautionary tale, not just for the contestant, but for all who watched it. A vivid example of how quickly things can go wrong in the kitchen when confidence overshadows capability. Just from a jar. Ultimately, this culinary debacle highlighted a fundamental truth. In the world of haute cuisine, there is no room for arrogance. Every dish is a test of a chef's abilities, and the only way to succeed is through a combination of creativity, discipline, and humility. But here comes another example you just cannot miss. In the chronicles of culinary disasters, few incidents compared to the infamous tortellini debacle that transpired during a particularly unforgettable episode. This moment not only shocked the judges, but also left viewers recoiling in disbelief. Tortellini, what's inside the filling? It's just a cheese. It's a packaged tortellini. When tortellini is mentioned in the context of a culinary competition, one might expect to see meticulously handcrafted pasta, created with care by an expert chef. However, the reality in this case was far from that ideal. The chef revealed that the tortellini he presented were not homemade, but rather store-bought, filled with cheese. Tortellini. That's how it's sold, chef. Tell me you use fresh tomatoes. Uh, they were canned tomatoes. The situation deteriorated further when the chef admitted that even the tomatoes served with the dish were not fresh. This confession was nothing short of culinary heresy, especially in a competition where freshness and quality are paramount. Had they not watched Kitchen Nightmares? Put mashed potatoes in there. It is canned salmon caviar. So, canned, canned. Did they not understand the exacting standards required to impress judges like Gordon Chef Ramsay? This ignorance and complacency seemed almost absurd, a failure to recognize the weight of the opportunity before them. Moving on, there's one contestant who the internet thinks shouldn't have made it to the final two. It's Virginia. She had just one good service out of like nine. Some are accusing Chef Ramsay of favoritism. And Keith, may he rest in peace, even called him out directly. I personally think that you have a hard on for Virginia. Here's another comment that went something like, I respect Chef Ramsay's opinions and decisions a lot. He eats pizza with a knife and fork and I'll keep my mouth shut. The favoritism towards Virginia though is a hell no. But that's what Reddit says. How about you? Do you think Chef Ramsay was biased? During the sixth dinner service, Virginia manned the fish station and had her peppered seared bluefin hamachi sashimi featured on the menu. At one point, she sent up raw scallops. I'm not, I'm upset about it, I wanna recook. Even though Sarah offered to help, Virginia turned her down. Yes, Chef! 
What'd I say, Virginia? I'm sorry, I forgot what else you said. Not a very wise decision, might I add, but then this happened. Virginia, how long? Uh, wait, hold on. What is going on right now? Virginia's mistakes and inconsistent timing with the sashimi slowed down the red kitchen, causing Chef Ramsay to mix up the blue team's appetizers across a few tables. Virginia then complained about her sashimi, saying it was messed up because of how the protein was moving. Ramsay was appalled by the inconsistent thickness of her slices. Problems on the fish station. And Keith's inconsistent. Chef Ramsay sent Maribel over to help Virginia, and while it made a difference, the red team was still way behind, since service had started an hour earlier. After several hours of struggling, Chef Ramsay had the blue team step in to help the red team finish service. I mean, you could have been louder. Go fuck around, Heather. And with that, Chef Ramsay left. Virginia felt humiliated that the blue team had to come to their rescue, highlighting just how out of control things had become. During the seventh dinner service, Virginia was at the garnish station. She struggled with cooking 20 different vegetable orders at once. On. Service, please. Push back two minutes to the entree. When her romaine hearts fell apart, Chef Ramsay warned her he wouldn't wait around for her lettuce. Missy. I'm not gonna wait for some stupid lettuce. In her last order, she panicked, putting her garnish in a pot instead of leaving it in the pan, and ended up serving garnishes overloaded with butter. Oh my god. Now you bring it to me with butter in there. Yes, chef. The carrots are there. Yes, chef. You want them in the Chef Ramsay lost his temper when she mentioned making tortellini, which wasn't even on the order. He called her out harshly. Read, oh, come here. You're right, chef. Now will you fucking shut up? Yes, chef. That was Chef Ramsay at his angriest. The only other time I've seen him losing his cool to this extent was with Giovanni. If you are a Hell's Kitchen fan, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, coming back to where we left off. At the end of the service, he lined up the final five and pointed out their lack of teamwork despite the service being completed. He told Virginia she had dug her own grave that night. You put yourself in the shit tonight. I know. Well, at least she knows. But, well, in the intense environment of culinary competition, every action is magnified under the scrutiny of the cameras. Season 17 of Hell's Kitchen featured a subtle yet alarming breach of kitchen etiquette that may have gone unnoticed by Gordon Ramsay, but certainly didn't escape the vigilant eyes of the audience. I'm doing a black cod with a cherry syrup that on this side you're genius, and on this side, you're crazy. During a high-pressure moment, as the red team grappled with the chaos of Hell's Kitchen, Robin found herself at a crucial crossroads. After a series of disappointing performances, she was desperate to redeem herself. Armed with a blend of peanut butter and blueberry gastric, she was determined to impress. As time slipped away, she turned to Dan, a trusted teammate, seeking his opinion on her dish. 15 minutes remaining. Ladies, are we incorporating all seven ingredients? What happened next, however, raised serious concerns. In a seemingly routine move, Robin dipped a spoon into her pan and handed it to Dan for a taste test, a common practice in the kitchen for feedback. But instead of discarding the spoon after Dan tasted it, Robin inexplicably returned it to the pan, completely unaware of the potential food safety risks her action posed. This lapse in judgment might have gone unnoticed in the moment, but it carried significant implications for hygiene and the integrity of the dish. I have like a bad dry mouth, I can't like... Robin always chokes her. In any professional kitchen, such oversights are simply inexcusable. The sanctity of the cooking process demands strict adherence to hygiene standards and meticulous attention to detail. The act of double dipping, as it's often called, is a cardinal sin in the culinary world, with the potential to contaminate the entire dish. As much as we both want to win, I don't want to give her some advice and then blame me when it doesn't taste good. So I'm going to focus on my own dish. What made this incident particularly concerning was the casualness with which it occurred, reflecting a broader issue of complacency that had taken hold within the red team. Pick your cod, Robin. Well, it's still not cooked. <laughs> Show some finesse, guys, yeah? Yes, sir. Although Gordon Ramsay didn't catch this particular transgression, the cameras did, capturing it in all its raw reality. For the viewers, it was a stark reminder of the importance of vigilance and accountability in the kitchen, even among the most skilled chefs. Let me find you more salt. In the aftermath, these moments, exposed by the unforgiving lens of the camera, serve as a powerful reminder of the relentless pursuit of culinary excellence that defines the competition. Every action, no matter how small, carries weight and consequence, making vigilance and professionalism non-negotiable in the kitchen. Is a contestant who claimed to have been cooking for most of her life, but why didn't her food speak for itself? In the signature dish challenge, Polly was the third contestant to face Ramsay's judgment. She had so much confidence in her culinary skills that this is what she had to say. If I can endure that, health kitchen is gonna mean nothing for me. I know what you are saying. Yeah, go, Polly. For her dish, Polly presented a focaccia bread accompanied by a flavorful garlic dipping oil. Sounds delicious, right? Well, unfortunately for Polly, Chef Ramsay wasn't quite as impressed as she had hoped. In fact, he was pretty brutal. Right now, 
I'd rather eat poodle shit than put During the chaotic prep phase, Polly let us in on a little secret that she never went to culinary school. Instead, she relied on her keen attention to detail to absorb everything that was said, all in the name of getting the job done. Well, better luck with that on this ground. As the dinner service kicked off, Polly found herself at the appetizer station. Now, this is where the heat turned up, and unfortunately, Polly started feeling the burn right from the start. As the first few tickets came in, she was already struggling to keep up. Thank goodness for Rachel, Maribel, and the ever-helpful sous chef Marianne, who came to her rescue. But here's the thing, Polly's first attempt at a risotto was, well, a complete disaster. Overcooked, stuck to the plate, and to top it off, the mushrooms were nowhere to be found. Chef Ramsay, being the discerning chef he is, couldn't believe his eyes. He wasn't just dismayed that Polly produced such a mess even with help, but he had to ask her if she was actually happy to send that monstrosity out into the dining room. An hour and a half into the chaos, and Polly was already on her fourth attempt at her very first risotto, and this was her first ticket. Chef Ramsay was not having it, folks. Not having it. The trash bin was piling up with food that was rejected. Food in the bin tonight that I've ever seen in 10 years. Yeah, you heard that right, a decade. That's a whole lot of wasted ingredients and a whole lot of disappointment for our fiery chef. So what did Chef Ramsay do? Well, he decided to shake things up, Ramsay style. He made Polly swap stations with Heather, declaring Polly as the new kitchen donkey while Heather took over the appetizer station. Talk about a kitchen shakeup. By this point, Polly could feel the heat rising, and she knew that being nice and friendly wasn't cutting it anymore. Following her stint on the show, Polly went back to her roots as a caterer and even dabbled in food blogging for a while. She appeared in various magazines and interviews, and these days, she's the proud owner of her own catering company called Rolling with the Food Snob. Do they have risotto on the menu? I hope not. As Polly made her plea to stay in the competition, she mustered up all the confidence she could and said this. I have the maturity and the depth proven in over my life that I can take challenges and face them and make the best. But there is nothing as ridiculous as what this next contestant did. And guess what's the craziest part? The fact that none of her teammates stepped in to correct her. Well, meet Sadi Dancy from season 13, who had a pretty poor start in the competition. But she eventually started to step up her game. However, I'm not sure what happened to her in the 8th episode when she totally messed up who the customers were going to be. You see, Hell's Kitchen hosted a dog show, and just like for any hosted event, both teams had to go through a challenge first. <laughs> Kennel Club. <laughs> Good morning. This was Sade's first challenge on the blue team, and I'm sure she wanted to prove to her new teammates that she had what it takes. Unfortunately, instead of showing her talent, she put the exact opposite on display. While everybody else had a clear idea of what the customers would like, Sade somehow assumed that they were actually cooking for dogs. Dog food. I've never done this before, but I guess it makes sense. It was the dog show challenge after all. So she decided to make a braised beef dish for the dogs. But no matter how dumb Sade's mistake was, what really pissed me off was how Steve Rosenthal and Brian Gallagher decided to not say anything to her to stop her from making such a major mistake. I'm really confused how Dyson loves this New York strip. She knows we don't have to cook for the dogs. Now, I have no idea how they expected to win the challenge as a team when they couldn't even support each other. But honestly, that's neither here nor there. After 45 minutes, when everybody finished their dishes, Sade realized how much she had screwed up. Realize, oh my god, these are human portions. And we were cooking for dogs. When Chef Ramsay noticed Sade's dish, he was dumbfounded. Fortunately for her, Sade was saved from secondhand embarrassment in front of the guest judges, since she got to sit out because the blue team had additional people on the team. Phew, barely got out of that one by the skin of her teeth. And this dish in particular was so poorly executed, Ramsay refused to even take a bite. It had barely been a minute since Scott joined the red team, and it seems like he was already trying to dominate. You gonna try and fry him? Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, like, that's gonna sit well with the women. I'm trying to put his two cents into everything. Scott, are you running the red team? I mean, the dude is surely gonna end up in trouble if he doesn't let the ladies play their game. But over on the blue team, Autumn had run into her own trouble. Anyone see the tasting spoon? So then, now I'm starting to wonder what's happening with the blood sausages. Did the red team figure out a way to salvage it? I never cooked with blood sausage. It was all nasty and brown and black looking. Well, looks like they didn't. Let's hope they try to make it better before Chef Ramsay digs into them. But disaster struck much before Chef Ramsay could even get his hands on them. Fuck me! It just busts. Yeah, that's a big pass for me. It doesn't even look appealing. I don't think anyone would want to even taste it. With just a few seconds left, the team start plating everything up, and Red Team was not happy with their dish. We have the blood sauces with a prune puree. Already you look negative. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but I don't think Chef Ramsay is gonna even try it. But, well, he did. And you won't believe how he reacted.
Well, what did I tell you? I mean, the dish came right out faster than it went in. I know meat pairs with all sorts of wild combinations, but mixing prunes with blood sausages? That's on another level. Scott, who came up with the idea, wasn't exactly taking responsibility for it, and the ladies weren't pleased. Meanwhile, it looked like the blue team was enjoying themselves while watching the situation unfold. That's a fucking disaster. Dope. But let's take a look at what the red team brought on themselves. The dish that we did was a beautiful dish. The pork was fucking gorgeous. That was delicious. Yeah, no way. I mean, that looks gorgeous. I mean, I would have made love to it right there. And if Chef Ramsay's reaction wasn't bad enough, you won't believe the punishment they landed. They need a good nose to tail clean. Is that clear? Yes, Chef. Talk about a real mess. While the blue team headed off to enjoy a relaxing day at the spa, the red team had the entire pigsty for themselves. But hey, that's what punishments are all about. It's meant to be a constant reminder to always put your best foot forward and definitely keep blood sausages and prunes away from each other. But what happened in this next episode is even worse. Many of the chefs who appear on the show aren't known for their dessert skills. However, when they're challenged to create a dessert, how do you think they're gonna handle it? Well, this sweet challenge was about to turn bitter. Today's challenge, each of you will be responsible for creating a sexy, delicious dessert. The contestants weren't thrilled about having to whip up a dessert, as their expertise lay mostly in savory dishes. But here's hoping that they figure something out soon. And it's not just the red team, but looks like blue team has their work cut out for them as well. The chefs have just one hour to create a romantic dessert. I have no idea what I'm gonna do. But seems like more than trying to figure out what to cook, they rather waste their time complaining. I've always said I'm the worst pastry chef on Hell's Kitchen. You can't be worse than me, there's no way. At this point, it was hard to figure which of the two teams would nail the challenge. The toffee and macadamia nut sticky bun with white chocolate drizzle. I mean, neither of them were confident of pulling it off as the timer continued to tick down. <laughs> Wailing, sticky bun, and tell me. Well, that was a close call for both teams, but it's not time to see which of the two teams would rise to the top. However, there was a twist. One of the red team's dishes had to be dropped. You present a dessert that's undercooked. Tommy. Oh man, it wasn't looking good for the red team. There was absolutely no harmony whatsoever, but they finally came to a decision, and guess whose dish they decided to drop? Dessert look like baby vomit. As soon as you shove a spoon in that, it's gonna go. That's not sexy. Yeah, Elise felt like she was stabbed in the back. But even before she could do anything about it, it was time for the taste test. The most stars wins. Ah, uh, jeez, oh Jesus. What the fuck? Each team was given points based on their dish, and going by the looks of it, the blue team was off to a rough start. One star. I really just made something that I know my girl would want to eat. So I was kind of cooking for her. But it didn't take long for them to win over the judges. Wow. I'd say three stars. Thank you. Great job. While the blue team was rocking their dessert, the red team was lagging behind. Yeah. Grainy. Wailing? One? Yes. Yeah. You know this wouldn't be happening if my dessert- And to make things worse, Elise's poor attitude wasn't helping making things better. As sweet as I told you. That's how Carrie always plays. Plays it safe. That was- Elsie believed her dessert was way superior to everyone else's. And yet, she was having to sit it out for no reason. It wasn't hard to notice how annoyed she was. And just as the red team had reached the end of the road, the final dish was presented to the judges. And well, what do you know? It managed to sweep the judges off their feet and they three stars. The red team managed to steal the win in those last few precious moments. But Chef Ramsay wasn't done. He wanted to give Elise's dish a taste. Dish. Elise really better put her money where her mouth is right now. Meanwhile, Elise was bursting with excitement. Throughout the challenge, she was pretty disappointed with having her dish dropped. But now, it was time for her to showcase her skills. And guess how it turned out to be? My own. Followed by a heart bypass. A dessert for 10? I probably could have put in a smaller glass. Yikes. Looks like all that buildup she gave earlier fell flat on its face. Quite literally. I mean, I know I would pass on this. It's in there at the bottom. Berries and the liqueur and vinegar. Wait, what? Did she add vinegar to a dessert? What's that now? I mean, what was she trying to do? Make wine out of it? But wait, because things only got worse from there. Shouldn't have. Smell the vinegar in there. I mean, that's a lot of vinegar, and there's no way whatever it was she made would taste anything close to a dessert. Disaster. You made the right choice dropping that, let me tell you. Chef Ramsay nailed it. It was disgusting. Well, looks like that should shut her up for a bit. I mean, clearly she had the worst dessert of the lot, and I'm sure everyone was heaving a sigh of relief for making the right decision. Honestly, <laughs> today's your lucky day. Yeah, the red team really dodged a bullet there, didn't they? Yeah, you can almost taste the vinegar through the screen. That's how overpowering it was. 
Anyway, moving on, if you remember, season 12 started off with a bang with lots of music and dance. Oh, I almost fell. But how long until it turns into someone's worst nightmare ever? It desserts, but I play to win. I said it from day one and I'll say it now. Yeah, all the fanfare wasn't about to last for long, especially for one contestant. You see, this time, the teams were split into two, men versus women, and both teams were tasked to cook the best possible version of their signature dishes. Dances, girls? Let's kick some blue team ass. However, soon enough, each of the teams ran into their own set of issues. Say something when you're coming with heart, Richard. I'm not sure if these other guys are qualified enough to be walking around the kitchen. Okay, this is gonna be hard to watch because none of them seem to be getting along with each other. While the men were struggling to keep things together, the women didn't seem to have a grip on their dishes either. Yes, chef. And it's not cooked yet? No, chef. I'd move your ass if I was you. With just 10 minutes left, how would that meat be able to cook all the way through? Would it end up being raw? Well, I guess only time will tell, or maybe this next clip. Three, two, one, and stop. But guess what? The drama is far from being over. Because guess what happened in the very next second? That's right. Wow, that was something I never expected. I mean, how did they even manage to keep all these people under wraps for so long? Meanwhile, the men were finally able to pull things together. To the men, good job. Chef Rams. But the surprises don't stop there. This time I was on Hell's Kitchen. All right, you don't really sound all right. Yeah, that's Jason from season nine. And no, he wasn't eliminated. He was just dehydrated and couldn't even get through the first service. But will season 12 be his lucky charm? Congratulations to the men. 2 nil. I mean, that was kind of a low blow. You can make fun of a dish, but not someone. I felt maybe Chef Ramsay didn't have to take it so far. What do you think? Coming back to the men, they were on a roll. I mean, they were way ahead of the women with their dishes. And it's cooked beefy. But wait till you see what the ladies were cooking up. Old scrambled eggs. With someone's vomit at the bottom. Nah, nothing appealing here. I mean, it just looked like plain soup. I mean, definitely I expected a lot better here. I'm sorry, you guys. Southern girl Keisha hopes to- Honestly, with every single dish they were ruining, the women were heading that much closer to the elimination round. But there was one exception. Butter. And steak's delicious. Finally, Chef Ramsay was impressed, and here's hoping they can take away the point from Mike. But you won't believe what he walked up with. Tortellini, what's inside the filling? It's just a cheese. It's a packaged tortellini. Fresh. See, it was all fine until he said packaged tortellini. And you can instantly see Chef Ramsay's face go down. Packaged fresh tortellini. That's how it's sold, Chef. Please tell me you use fresh tomatoes. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you've seen even one episode of Kitchen Nightmares, then you know what Chef Ramsay feels about packaged or canned food. And just when you thought it couldn't get worse, it did. Tomatoes. Canned tomatoes? Packaged fresh tortellinis? It was almost as if Mike had no interest in cooking. It was as if he just whipped up something that wouldn't need a lot of effort. Chef Ramsay was pissed. But what he did next was shocking. Come on, that was a joke. That's where the dish really belonged. I mean, there was nothing left to judge. And guess what this meant? Congratulations, that was delicious. Well done, ladies. But Mike wasn't too happy with Chef Ramsay's reaction. Uh, instead of falling back in line and hanging his head down like he should have, Matt decided to retort. I think it's packaged dog food. Fuck, that's bullshit, bro. Well, I guess he forgot that he was the one who decided to not put any effort and just take the easy route out. But Chef Ramsay wasn't having it. What did you just say? But you have to give it to this guy. The amount of confidence to try and intimidate Chef Ramsay is beyond me. Not my back. Gotta fuck off. Yeah. Looks like Mike has officially made it to Chef Ramsay's hate list. But if all that yammering I did about lazy cooks wasn't any indication, Monique didn't fare any better either. I want to know how you made it. It's just from a jar. <laughs> so you didn't even make the marinara sauce? No. You see, Monique whipped up something she dubbed Moe's Pasta, and she was coming in with a hell of a secret recipe. The perfect score of five to win for the women. Tell me about the marinara sauce. And Chef Ramsay immediately knew something was off, so he tossed her a pretty softball question for literally any other contestant, what's in the marinara? And well, she sheepishly confessed she'd just cracked open a jar of the store-bought stuff. I want to know how you made it. It's just from a As Chef Ramsay took a taste, Monique dropped the bomb about her shortcut while he was in the middle of it. 
and let's just say his reaction was not exactly the kind of impression you'd want to leave on anyone, let alone the Gordon Ramsay. So you didn't even make them out. He almost immediately spat out that first bite. And honestly, good on him. So you didn't even make them out. But that wasn't where things got interesting. Oh no. Signature stinkers are more common than you'd think. Monique doubled down and blamed Chef Ramsay for not explicitly banning pre-made sauce. Not sauce. No. I don't Some rules just go without saying, Monique. Now, remind me what the number one rule of the show is? To freaking cook. But let's be real, everyone from the crew to the front row knew she was grasping at straws. Monique was all but asking for trouble when she decided to metaphorically spit in Ramsay's face. I don't think there's anything wrong with canned sauce. Unless you're from Italy, and you're like- So, it couldn't be more obvious that the red team's chances started to fizzle out as impotently as you could ever imagine. Eventually, they ended up losing the challenge by a measly three points, and boy, was Monique on the receiving end of some serious heat. You should've just told me, I would've did it. You came oh, I've to the kitchen. I've gotta tell you what I want. Yes! As punishment, they were tasked with resetting the entire dining room for the big opening night. Imagine folding napkins and polishing cutlery while being left to simmer in your very first defeat. Not a fate I'd ever want to be stuck with. I'll tell you that much. Now, let's talk about Monique's attitude during this whole ordeal. If you ask me, to put it straight, she wasn't exactly winning Miss Congeniality that season. Nor, in any other season, had she been unfortunate enough to grace the kitchen before or after this round. Instead of rallying behind Allison's leadership, she seemed more interested in playing the blame game. I mean, just watch that clip again and tell me I'm wrong. No, seriously, tell me I'm wrong, I dare you. Get in the comments, you know you want to. Anyway, vague threats aside, Allison wasn't about to take any kind of mistreatment lying down. She rightfully pointed out that Monique's jarred sauce was the reason they were here in the first place, an observation that wasn't lost on anyone. Except good old Mo, of course. Tomato sauce for Chef Ramsay, who does that? Now, I'm not sure what's more shocking, that she had the gall to try and pull this off in the first place, or the fact that she seemingly didn't understand the severity of the mistake she'd made. But at least Mo's pasta wasn't enough to get Chef Ramsay sick. It was just a normal amount of bad. But the next dish almost made him throw up. Before disaster struck, contestants from season 3 were given an unusual shopping opportunity, unlike what you might expect. Congratulate you guys and wish you good luck, but not good enough luck to win. My goal. They were having a hard time keeping up with the one hour limit and nearly ran out of time as a result. Nice. Hell yeah. But the blue team wasn't aware of what was coming at them in the very next minute. Thanks so much. Oh. <laughs> Hello there. The blue team went over their $100 budget and had to remove one item from their shopping list. This was challenging because every ingredient was crucial to their dish. <laughs> one spaghetti! One risotto! One cr The men are clearly having a tough time getting along with each other. Despite this, they push through and head back to the kitchen. Once there, the cooks made a promising start, but it's evident that things may not turn out well in the end. That's right. It's me. I really hope they put something good out, because to me, this does not look good at all. Ramsey, right? Yes, sir. For Star General. Time to button it now and start cooking. But even with less ingredients, it looked like the men were using their brains to make things better. Well, at least one team was working on getting along with each other, rather than going for each other's neck. For a little context, the teams were cooking for a wedding reception, and they would be choosing the best team's food for the menu. Man. The bride and groom chose the men's appetizers for the wedding, and it seems like maybe the red team wasn't really fond of it. Correction! They didn't even want to serve the dish in the first place. And the reason why I wear the chef has... When it was time for the second dish, the women easily managed to win a point. Damn! The rice is raw. But when it came to the final dish, Melissa wasn't too sure. I think Chef Ramsay might need to read a couple of books. He has... Huh, I wonder why she wasn't ready to serve the dish. Who he's talking to. Chef Ramsay had no idea what was up with her. Plus, she was putting him in an embarrassing situation in front of his guests. Dark. Whose is this? Chef Ramsay is looking for someone to blow him away. It's almost like watching a ticking time bomb that was ready to go off if the food didn't end up on the table in the next 10 seconds. And you'd never guess what was under the dome. Plain, blonde, and boring. Fails to deliver. Sushi. Wait, what on earth is that? Passes something tinned in a can. 
doesn't fare much better. Yeah, I don't think a taste test was even necessary to know who won. You know, it's a really bad dish when the team that cooked it says it looks like shit. You've burned the thing. Leaves Ramsay still hungry for a- I mean, come on, I wouldn't want to serve something like that at my wedding or anywhere else. I mean, this was a disaster. My signature dish is gonna help me stand out, because I'm a true culinarian. I understand what But let's see if the blue team had it in the picket, or simply stole the win without having to put much effort. About to be punked. <laughs> Diver scallops. That's like miles better than just a piece of fried duck on a plate. Kind of annoying that Melissa wasn't even stepping up and taking responsibility for her mistakes. All she did was just stand there and throw an attitude at Chef Ramsay. Speaking of attitude, here comes Matt Siegel, the true culinarian, who really took the whole fancy ingredients thing to a whole new level. Now, because I'm a true culinarian, I understand what Gordon's looking for. What I mean, who in their right mind combines raw venison, diver scallops, caviar, and grated white chocolate and calls it a dish? I call it exotic tartar. Chef Ramsay's face was like, seriously? Is this guy for real? He even joked about whether Matt was on some special herbs, if you catch my drift. Do you smoke? Cigarettes? No. Chef Ramsay really went for it, didn't he? I mean, he took a brave bite of Matt's creation, but the next moment, his face turned into this epic mix of chewing on lemon and lime at the same time. And before you knew it, he was spitting it out. <laughs> Chef Ramsay didn't hold back. He couldn't. He straight up declared Matt's concoction as the absolute worst mashup of flavors he'd ever encountered in his two decades of cooking. That's saying something. Matt's dish definitely earned its spot in the history books as a legendary disaster in the kitchen. No doubt about it. I really don't understand what Chef Ramsay didn't like about the dish. I'm a little boggled on that. Really? Oh, what a nightmare of a dish. Moving on, may Tom rest in peace, but ah, uh, what a train wreck he was on the show, man. Hey, listen, star! Come here, you, you idiot. Can that enough? What I'm trying to tell you in your fucking eyeballs that the quail and the spaghetti now. Right, yeah, and you're putting the quail. Now I have the ones there. That's for that fucking order there! Oh. And after almost setting the whole kitchen on fire, what do you think Chef Ramsay can say other than this? They're gonna blow fire in your face, you fucking donkey! Okay, so I know you're itching to find out how things got this bad, so let me give you a quick refresher. So during the dinner service, Tom Pauly was assigned to the meat station. So this dude was ready to conquer the culinary challenges of Hell's Kitchen. But little did he know that this night would be anything but smooth sailing. Seven minutes, why is that wrong? Quail. Oh no. Quail sat a rest. Cooked. Hello, what time did I call out the order? Ten. As the orders started rolling in and the heat turned up, Heather West, one of his teammates, questioned the temperature of his pan. And what does Tom do? Right out of the gate, he dropped a bombshell on Ramsey. He confessed that he hadn't even started cooking the quail, despite the order being placed an hour ago. Needless to say, Chef Ramsay's frustration began to simmer. It doesn't hurt, does it? Doesn't, doesn't no, it does. I can't yell. I can't cry. All I have to do is I gotta do it. To make things worse, when it was time to serve those delectable Wellingtons, Tom proudly presented a batch that turned out to be undercooked. Luckily, Keith came to the rescue and assured Chef Ramsay that they could be ready in just about four minutes. Phew. Thank goodness! A huge crisis averted right there. But things had to screw up all over again. Because just as tensions reached the boiling point, disaster struck. You see, the duck in Tom's pan decided it had enough of the heat and started to burn. Chef Ramsay, in an act of rescue, instructed Tom to step aside and salvage the sizzling pan from becoming a charred catastrophe. Hey, leave it! Just fucking leave it! You're firing your face, you fucking donkey! Actually, that is rather a very gentle way of putting what happened into words. Because this is how things turned out. The duck, you're cooking in a burnt pan, you fucking dick! Feeling the mounting pressure, Ramsay called upon Keith to take over the meat station, asking him to oversee that he doesn't cook anything. But Tom should have just shut up. Because when he dared to question Chef Ramsay's instructions, his concerns weren't met with the greatest reaction. Shut it! Phew! That dinner service was a total disaster. And what do you know? Both the teams were declared joint losers before being kicked out of service. However, Tom was the only contestant who was on the receiving end of this. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I've had enough. I've had enough! I cannot believe you're actually attempting to fucking win a race. And with that, we've reached the end of our video. But let me know who else you would add to the list in the comments below. 
And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you're here for the drama, don't miss this video where Ramsay's fallout with a chef left everyone stunned.